Stakes tries to shake loose from Ute. Rose Maddox on the outside in third. Tribal Bid on the inside of Squared Shady. They're in the final furlong and increased stakes. Still very strong on the front end. And increased stakes with a two-length lead over Ute. Increased stakes. Ute with a final try. Increased stakes. Never looked a loser. Ute second best. Rose Maddox third, then Squared Shady. The fourth starts to late pick five. Scratch number five by Cameron. 23 minutes to the outside. They're in the gate. And they're off. Chloe's girl and brocade the first two outs. Sweet Talk comes away third. Micro Share, fourth in the early stages, and Happy Happy Trails. It's Chloe's girl with seven furlongs to run, leading the way by about a length. Brocade is second, two more back to Sweet Talked in third. Micro Share, four off the pace in fourth, and another five to Happy Happy. Past the six furlong pole, and it's Chloe's girl leading the way by three quarters of a length. Brocade now cuts right into that margin, it's down to a head. And now they're on even terms with Brocade taking the lead. Three more back to Sweet Talked in third. Microshare in hand down at the rail fourth. And now a very big gap to Happy Happy. The field heads toward the 3 8 pole. And Brocade is the narrow leader. Chloe's girl on the inside second. A length and a half back to Sweet Talked in third. And Microshare fourth. About three lengths off the pace. A distance to Happy Happy. Nearing the quarter pole, Brocade a length and a half. Microshare finds room. And here's Microshare pouncing at the quarter pole, taking command. And Microshare is gone. Microshare opens up two. Brocade back to second, followed by Sweet Talked in third. And then Chloe's girl. Microshare opening up with every stride. It's a five length lead past the 16th pole. And Microshare will make short work of the competition. Geared down, cruising to victory. Microshare, a four and a half length winner. Brocade second, Chloe's girl third, then Sweet Talk. Kimmer, they're in the gate. And they're off. Me Likey, very quick away from the gate, tries to clear off, and Dream Robber comes through on the inside second. They're followed by Catfish Charlie, racing right next to Sometimes Always. Two more to Kimmer and Musical Gem at the back. It is Dream Robber who heads toward the 3 8 pole with a three-quarter length lead. Me Likey back to second, followed by Catfish Charlie, sometimes always three in front of Kimmer, and a length and a half to Musical Gem. Less than three furlongs to run, and it's Dream Robber a half length in front. Me Likey trying to come back, but is hard ridden in second. Three more lengths to sometimes always. Kimmer making headway on the outside of Catfish Charlie. Musical Gem outside of them. Dream Robber at the top of the stretch opens it up to two. Me Likey is in second, sometimes always finishing with some interest in third, followed by Kimmer, a 16th to go. Dream Robber, two length lead. Me Likey gamely trying to hold second, but no match for Dream Robber. Dream Robber wins convincingly. Photo for second got very tight, very close indeed, between Me Likey and Kimmer. Then sometimes always in Catfish Charlie. Zydeco Mama.
They're in the gate, and they're off. Derby Quest began well. Here's Octane now moving up to take the lead. Split then double has speed two. And in the center of the course, Anna Glossa joins the party as well. On the inside, Fairly Cakes is under a bit of a hold, slightly eager. Accelerina settles in a good spot, fifth by the stands. Two more to Pop Pop's Dream inside Zydeco Mama and Derby Quest, who broke well, trails. Into the first turn they go, and it's split, then double, showing the way. Octane a length back second. Another length and a half. Fairy Cakes along the rail, still a little bit eager in third. And outside of her comes Anaglossa fourth, about three lengths off the lead. Two more back to Accelerina, nicely settled. Two in front of Pop Pop's Dream, Zydeco Mama, Derby Quest outside that pair. They head toward the half-mile pole. Split, then double, uncontested. Cruising along with a two-length lead on Octane second. Fairy Cakes at the rail. Then comes Anaglossa in fourth. Accelerina, five lengths off the lead, joined by Pop Pop's Dream in the orange colors at the rail. Then it's Zydeco Mama and Derby Quest. Rounding the turn, split, then double has been in control throughout. Octane a length back second. Anaglossa now takes third. Now Accelerina starts to kick in. And Accelerina, light blue silks with a clear shot, coming fast now at the top of the stretch. And in the blink of an eye, Accelerina has stormed to the front and opened up too. Anaglossa in second. Pop Pop Stream is next. It's Accelerina turning it on. Look at those strides late. Accelerina wins by three. Pop Pop Stream second. Anaglossa third, then split, then double, followed by Octane. The rule of kings to the outside. And they're off. The rule of kings hopped in the air, had a very awkward start. Fenestra quick, but I'm Corfu faster. Coming away third is Fury Cap. At the rail, Mr. Bold is fourth, six lengths off the speed. Quick finish, asks for a little bit more. Five in front of the rule of kings. Past the half mile, I'm Corfu, blazing the way a length and a half to Finestra second. Then Fury Cap, good trip third, inching closer with every stride. Quick finish, Mr. Bold, and a long way to the rule of kings. Past the three eighths, I'm Corfu, the leader. Finestra just a neck back second. A length to Fury Cap, three wide in third. Then Mr. Bold at the rail, five lengths off the lead, and quick finish. They turn for home. I'm Corfu trying to fend off Finestra. They're shoulder to shoulder coming to the eighth pole. And Finestra is up to take a narrow lead, trying to shift about as he puts away. I'm Corfu. Five back to Fury Cap in third. A 16th to go. And Finestra opens up a length and a half, and he's home. Finestra takes care of business. I'm Corfu second. Fury Cap a distant third. Then Mr. Bowl. The last one will be Anaconda. They're in the gate. And they're off. Eastern Ocean is going out for the early lead. Tiz Plus hustled through along the inside to show some speed. Anaconda is widest of all. Hudson Ridge won from the outside. Crew Dragon now backs off the early speed as they move into the first turn. And it's Tiz Plus hugging the rail and going on with it. Has it by a length. Eastern Ocean is in second. Hudson Ridge, Crew Dragon at the rail in fourth. Anaconda reserved fifth, four lengths off the lead. Evening Sun under a hold as well. And a gap of five to Camaraderie, who did not have a smooth beginning. Down the back stretch they go. 
and it's Tiz Plus, three quarters of a length. Hudson Ridge, Eastern Ocean in between them. They're followed by Crew Dragon, three and a half off the leader, and Anaconda is next, fifth, four off the pace. Another two, Evening Sun and Camaraderie. Into the far turn, Tiz Plus by a length, Eastern Ocean, Hudson Ridge, Hudson Ridge now clearly into second. Anaconda starts to move in. Yellow cap on the outside. Has about three lengths to find. Evening Sun, Camaraderie. They've taken closer order behind Tiz Plus. Tiz Plus in front. Anaconda makes a wide bid to try and run him down in second. Far outside, Camaraderie. Evening Sun, one from the outside. A furlong out. Tiz Plus digging in by two. Evening Sun now bearing down. And here's Evening Sun swooping on the outside. Evening Sun and Mike Smith getting up. Tiz Plus second. Anaconda was third, followed by Camaraderie and True Crew Dragon. Crew Dragon.
Our seminar guest today is a handicapping expert whose forte is turf racing. And the good news is, of the nine races today, five are on the lawn. Hi, everybody. My name is Tom Quigley, VIP player concierge. Also, your seminar host for the next 40 minutes, as you can tell behind us, Conditions today are fast and firm here at the Great Race Place. Delighted he decided to join us. You've seen him on the seminar before. He's given out many double-digit winners. We expect nothing less today. His <laughs> name's Steve Pollock. Steve, welcome to the seminar. Thanks for having me, Tom. Uh, great to be here. The weather could not be any better. And I will tell you right off the bat, this is going to be interesting because I'm getting older and I can no longer see my form without glasses. Welcome to the club. So, but now I realize that I can't see you guys with them on. That might be better. It might be better. So what else is new for me? It's going to be crazy, but uh, I will uh, be able to see the information and, and transfer it to the fans, which is what we're trying to do here anyway. We want you completely focused on the racing <laughs> form, that's for sure. And I tease that you're kind of a, uh, your forte is with turf racing. So let's talk about that. Why do you consider turf racing maybe easier to handicap than the main track? I think the horses are more consistent on the turf. I, I am a big sheet guy as well, uh, thoroughgraph sheets. I, I, horses tend to go more up and down on the dirt than they do on the turf. And I think you can really figure out what a horse is doing and what their what their talent level is and then get a more consistent effort out of them next time. Whereas on the dirt, you're always trying to figure out, is this the day today? Did he just run his peak race? And I think the turf horses are a little bit more in a straight line. So I do like that fact. And then I'm, I'm really good at trips. I think trips are a little bit easier for turf. And right now, boy, Santa Anita, it's a little bit of it is new because we got all these different sprint distances. You know, we're not just running down the hill, which you and I love and we, we miss, but we are getting some of that back. But we're getting five for a long grass races. We're getting six for a long grass races. We're getting six and a half out of a shoot, which is actually very different. And we got a mile, a mile and an eighth. And then we've got a marathon race today. So there's a lot of different distances. There are little nuances to each of those. And uh, we'll try to give you a little bit of a tip here and there. Uh, but, but turf racing, to me, they're just more consistent. And if you can work out the right trip, I'm really big on working out the trip. Where is this horse going to be? Can this horse save some ground? Because if they can save ground and they can cut a corner here or there, maybe a little bit slower horse can beat a little bit better horse. How important, Steve, are internal fractions in the late kick on the turf? Internal fractions are gigantic. Uh, they're very, very big for me because that late kick is going to have more. It's going to have more zest to it if those horses are able to get the right position, the right trip. Using they're, your terminology. they're getting, they're getting the right trip. So uh, internal fractions are very important. Getting those right, especially now with the riders changing, like we're doing. We've got a lot of changes going on, so you're always going to have to figure. How is this rider going to do? What are they going to, what fractions is this guy going to set? And I do look at that. I'll look at who's on the lead. How fast does this guy usually go? A guy like Edwin Maldonado might go faster than you think. They might, might set things up a little bit better for a late runner, but he also might be able to sneak away. So there's a little bit of nuances. You know, some of the guys, some of the Hall of Famers that we've had in the past, like a Chris McCarron, he would get on a horse every time. And I would say, I don't have any idea how this guy is going to go 48 on the front end, but he would do it. He just had an art of getting to the lead and being able to go a second or a second and a half slower than the other guys, and his horse would have more in the tank late in the race. So a little bit of it has to do with the jockeys, but those internal fractions are extremely important. I use Brisnet. I use their early pace numbers, and I use the average of their last five races, and I'll throw out any abnormal thing they might do, like if they run on a different surface or if they run an unusual distance like a mile and a half. I try to use their last five races and get an average. And by doing that, it really helps me take, takes me some time to get that number, but it helps me to really figure out who is more likely to be on the pace and how fast is this pace going to be. You touched upon the riders. Let's talk about some riders who maybe are not that good on the turf course. We won't name any names, but why do you think some riders struggle on the turf course consistently? Well, I think they, they don't want to go back to their owner and tell them I got buried down on the inside. Because saving ground is everything, and, you, and there's an art to saving ground and then getting out at the right time. And one of the things that Kent Sormo, boy, we sure hope things go better for him. And he Corey gets, Nakatani gets comes to mind. Corey Nakatani. Those guys were so good at timing. It, it made it look seamless. It looked easy. They would get over to the rail, and they would time it right on the turn, and they would find a way to get through the inside, or if they had to go to the outside, or they would find a split, and they just did it seamlessly. Pratt seems to do it very easily. 
I think Rispoli is pretty good, but obviously he's the guy that goes up and down, and now we're going to lose him. So now we've got to find some guys that have struggled on the turf. Van Dyke looked like he was moving up. Maybe he can move back into the mix. Cedillo's going to get a lot of opportunity, but he really hasn't proven himself as a good grass rider. Can he improve? And these are going to be questions. Can Joey Bravo get more mounts? He hasn't really had a lot of mounts, but he had an amazing amount of success at Del Mar last summer, and he was really moving into the Santa Anita. He was doing good. Now he's been quiet. Are these veterans going to come back and ride more? Victor Espinosa, Mike Smith, they're a little bit different riders on the turf. They like to go to the lead, or they like to maybe take back a little bit more and go a little bit more around the field. So there's some room for some of these journeymen that maybe haven't had as much success to move up with uh, with some of the changes we're going to have here in Southern California. We're old enough to remember trainer Bobby Franklin. I remember him instructing the riders, live or die by the rail. In other words, that's why DeSarmo and Nakatani learned their craft so well, because they listened to Bobby. They waited for that seam. They waited for that room. But you're right. It's an art because some uh, jockeys just seem to get in trouble, never seem to find that seam. They try and follow that type of logic, but it just doesn't work for them. And then consequent consequently, they kind of tend to drift outside. And sometimes that's not really the path to victory. Mm. When they're getting nervous, it's almost like the horse can feel it. You know, we're down the backside and they're on the inside there. And you can start to tell that the jock is getting antsy. And you know, as a horse player, you're like, oh boy, yeah. he's feeling nervous here. He's not going to find that room. Whereas, like you said, some of the guys like Pratt's riding today, like Rispoli, those guys are just sitting chilly on their horse. And they're like, I'm going to find room. It's going to happen for me. Maybe I don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but I'll make the adjustment right when it happens so that I can make that instant move and get to the right spot and win this race. It's the only occupation where you have an ambulance following you. And of course you have to make split second decisions. <laughs> Easy for two overweight guys to be oh jockeys, but nevertheless, we're going to find out who Steve likes on today's nine race card. Before we do any of that, we're going to toss the microphone over to track announcer, Frank Miramati and get the early changes on today's beautiful Saturday afternoon here at the great race place. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Senita Park. Here are the early changes. The track is fast. The turf is firm. The rail on the turf out zero feet. First race, the Santa Anita Starter Series, short leg one, scratch number six, Candy Zip. Scratch number nine, Vroisky. Six and nine out of the first, start of the early pick five. Race two starts the early pick four, scratch number four, Ducks on the pond. And with that scratch, there's no show wagering. Turning to race three, number one, Vulin, two pounds over. Fourth race is the start of the Rainbow Six. The jackpot pool for a single ticket winner starts at $284,000. Just a blinker note in race four. Fifth race kicks off the late pick five. No changes in the fifth. There are no changes in race six, start of the late pick four. Seventh race, we have a program scratch of number seven, Precious Insight. In the eighth race, number four, Island Life carries two pounds over. Six, Big Passion, one pound over. And the ninth is the grade three San Luis race stakes. Scratch number one, say the word. And scratch number seven, award winner. One and seven out of the San Luis Ray. And there will be a revised morning line posted for the ninth race. Eighth race today will start the Golden Hour Pick 4. The ninth starts the $5 Golden Hour Double. Enjoy your afternoon at the Great Race Place. Post time for the opener is in 58 minutes. At 12.30, at this time, we go back to Quigley's Corner. Tom's special guest today 
is Steve Pollock. Welcome back. We're talking horses with veteran horse player Steve Pollock. You can hear him every Saturday on the Racing Racing Jason radio show. You can also get his picks online. We'll get into that a little bit momentarily. But first things first, Steve, got a good nine race card, including race number one, which in my opinion is a grab bag, primarily because I don't like the chances of the morning line favorite number 10, Psycho Dar. I'll get to that in one second. But keep in mind, we're sprinting five furlongs in the turquoise. This is a starter allowance race. The rails today are at zero feet. And of course, race one begins the popular 50 cent early pick five. Two scratches. Scratch the six and nine leaves us with a field of eight before we get your thoughts on the race steve i wanted to show the replay from just six six days ago that two runners exit out of that are in this particular race number four barrist in the bold hung a dirty nose victory on number five never have i ever before we get your thoughts on the race let's watch that replay from six days ago and watch them battle down to the wire And they're off. Very even start. Salardi is flashing his usual early speed. Polar on the outside is up close. Never have I ever and never have I ever now takes the lead from Polar. And Salardi will be third in the early going, about two lengths off the pace. They're followed on the inside by Barriston the Bold, who's in a little bit of traffic. Extreme outside, highly distorted, is up to take the fourth spot and is about two and a half lengths off the lead as the field rounds the far turn. The leader at the rail is still never have I ever pressed throughout by Polar. It's another two lengths back to Salardi. Jamming Eddie is very wide turning for home. In behind horses, Niles Channel down at the rail, Continental Divide. It's been never have I ever dominating thus far. Barrist and the Bold, Salardi are both chasing with determination. Never have I ever. Barrist and the Bold's coming now. Here's Barrist and the Bold. Photo finish. It's so tight. Barrist and the Bold surged right on the money. He and never have I ever are in a close photo. Niles Channel was closing late with Salardi. It's a very close photo in race one. Steve, we just saw the photo finish between Never Have I Ever and Barrist and Bold. You watch a lot of replays. One thing that caught my eye is Never Have I Ever was hustled on the lead, but then grabbed uh, fairly quickly by jockey Chris Amy. Still went 21.22 for the opening quarter. There might be more early speed there. The question for you is how do you generally treat horses coming back on such short rest? Coming back in six days, are they automatic tosses? Are they individual, you know, uh, situations for you? How do you evaluate quick turnaround horses? It's an individual situation for me. I generally don't like it. It's a really tough, tough puzzle for the for the fans for sure. And what's tough about Never Have I Ever in here is, is it looks like there's three or four others. Incredible amount of early speed. Absolutely want the lead. But in a five furlong grass race, isn't the lead where you want to be? 100%. And if you're going to close, you, you know, you want to save some ground early, you know. So a horse like Psychodar, who's way on the outside, you know, it's going to be very tough for this horse. Plus, the Northern California shippers have been really struggling down here. I don't know why, but it's really something that I note because I've made some good money betting those horses over the years, and they are just not firing right now. So That I far turn comes up awful quickly for the outside sure drawn post horses sprinting on the turf course, sure particularly does. at five furlongs. Yeah, it's fine. For a closer, too. You know, if you're outside, maybe if you got speed, you can get position. Now, we're knocking the favorite, Psycho Dar. We've watched the replay of the two runners coming back in six days, but you're actually going in a different direction. Boy, it's, a, again, a tough, tough call in here, but I'm going to go with the most inside of the speed, Mr. Lovejoy. Uh, this horse comes from the Vladimir Seren barn. How hot has this barn been of late? Had another win yesterday. Another win yesterday on a horse that I really didn't think had any chance. So this is a horse that's a 14-time winner. Uh, you can see the workouts down there on the bottom. It looks like this horse been working very fast over at Turf Paradise. And uh, we're just going to take a little bit of a shot in here because I think this is it's a, such a tough race. Again, not a bad race to hit the all box in the first race of that pick five, uh, Tom. But uh, for me, I'm going to go with Mr. Lovejoy and then really tough to decide between Never Have I Ever and Barrist in the Bold. I'm going to go with Barrist in the Bold in here. Uh, because I think never have I ever might be in the middle of that pace battle in here and Barrison the Bold could running 
uh, come get them late. But again, this one's got to overcome that coming back in a, in, a, in a week in here. So in a race that I think is very, very difficult, we'll put the two Mr. Lovejoy over the four Barrist in the bowl. A couple of notes about number two, Mr. Lovejoy. Exit's a very productive race, although it was back on March 13th when we last saw him in the afternoon. There's been two next out runner, winners, the second place finish posterized, as well as the horse who finished second to last fantastic day. So the company line is good. Also, you'll note Mr. Lovejoy, although he's running at San Anita today, has been prepping for this race at Turf Paradise, which is a bit unusual for San Anita-based runners. Race number two begins the 50 cent early pick for this time. We're sprinting on the main track, six and a half furlongs of the distance. Maiden claiming three-year-old fillies in for a $75,000 tag. Scratch the four, leaves us with a field of four. Number five, work to live, taking blinkers off for trainer Timmy Octine, as well, in, as well as dropping down in class and going turf to dirt is the seven to five morning line favorite. Steve, what say you about race two? I think the seven to five morning line favorite is, is probably the horse to beat, but I'm going to go with the two horse Nang Singha, I guess is how you're going to pronounce it. Sounds about that. right. Uh, broke from the far outside first time out, which is always tough to do. He did actually break pretty straight. This horse in the middle of the race, as they were turning for home, forked down to the inside. It's very tough for these horses, whatever lead they might be on. Hopefully it's the right lead. But when they fork into the left, they tend to lose their momentum. And I thought this one really kept to his task nicely. It's jumping up quite a bit. I'm a big fan of Gary Studi. I, I wish he was able to get some more horses. Uh, maybe if he can get some wins with horses like this one. Uh, he'll, he'll get it back going again, but 10, 12 years ago, this guy was one of the best claiming trainers around. And I still think he knows what to do with a good horse. And I think he's got a decent horse in here. Nang Singha going to be my top horse in here. The two, and we'll put the five work to live in the second spot. Nang Singha, as, as uh, Steve mentioned, trained by Gary Studi. Gary Studi and Tyler Bass hooked up with time for Ebby last weekend off the long layoff. So good to see Gary back in the winner's circle. Also, a breeding note on Nang Singha. Related to Soy Fett, you might remember, originally trained wow. by Gary Studi, then transferred Barnes over to Leonard Powell, and the rest is history. Race number three, we're back on the turf course. This is one mile in distance for Phillies and Mares. Three-year-olds and up, maiden special weights. A field of eight. Take note number two, the jockey on number – take note the jockey on number two, I should say, Glenn All, is Joe Bravo. Congratulations to to Joe Bravo, who is this year's George George Wolf Award winner, uh, certainly voted on by his peers, and a job well done to you, Mr. Bravo. Uh, we've got a field of eight, as I mentioned, Stephen, the Maury Line favorite number six, Carol Girl, one of three trained in the race by trainer Richie Baltus. Uh, tell us who you like in this turf race and why. You know, I, I'm going to go reverse in this race, and, and, and that is – I thought a lot of these horses ran poorly in their last race and don't look like they're that good. When I see that, I tend to think those races are won more by horses that are on the lead. And even though Phenom really stopped last time, I thought maybe the horse stopped a little bit because the winner of that race, Sterling Crest, ran so well. If you'll remember, Sterling Crest pressed that horse fairly early in the race. Phenom got away from her. Sterling Crest came out, was really resolute in going after her. And I thought that maybe hurt phenom a little bit maybe her result didn't didn't run as well carol girl was able to catch her late i don't think all that much of carol girl i think she's probably the horse to beat but second time going long i'm going to go to phenom here this is a big rider change you get the 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 very very classy uh, jr velasquez in the irons in here i do think that makes a difference this horse is definitely the speed of the speed speed's been good here i know the rails are at zero i prefer the rail to be out for this horse but i'm going to give phenom a shot to go wire to wire here and I've got Carol Girl slightly over Sunny Morning. Neither one of those horses were that impressive to me on tape in either one of their races, but I'll put Carol Girl second. It's the four phenom and a mild upset here for me in the third over Carol Girl. A couple of additional comments on Steve's top selection, number four, Phenom. He looked up the pedigree for the dam. She was effective going long on turf, so maybe this is what Phenom wanted to do all along. And uh, Steve mentioned the jockey change over to Johnny V. Interestingly enough, over the last two years, they've teamed up, well, he's teamed up, I should say, with trainer Phil D'Amato with no success. 0 for 11 up to this point. And, of course, John Velasquez's agent is Ron Anderson, very good friends with trainer Phil D'Amato. Race number four begins the 20-cent rainbow pick six. Jackpot single ticket carry over now up to $284,000. And we kick things off, sprinting six furlongs in the main track. Allowance optional claiming types, non-winners of one other than. We've got a field of five. The Moyne Line favorite number four, Scary Fast Smile, off a very impressive victory for trainer Doug O'Neill. Eight to five on the Moyne Line. Before we get your selection in the race, Steve, I wanted to watch a workout courtesy of our friends at XBTV for number three, Bruto, taking the blinkers off for trainer Bob Baffert. This workout is way back on January 31st. We haven't seen Bruto in quite some time, so there's certainly been more workouts since then. But as they break from the gate, take note of who Bruto is working with. 
He's inside uh, of none other than Country Grammar. Those of you who follow uh, racing know that Country Grammar just missed, finished a very good second in the Saudi Cup. And you can see as we watch this team drill breaking from the gate that uh, certainly Bruto has the early advantage over Country Grammar as they continue the workout here and pass a couple of uh, other workers who are going to get involved much later in the workout. Bruto, you can see, is going relatively easy, is not wearing blinkers. And, of course, blinkers come off today. And that's usually a dangerous move by the Bob Baffert bar. And you can see in the racing form, he wins at a 44% win clip. And almost all of his good horses at some point in their career, whether it was Justify or American Pharaoh, all took blinkers off. I'm not putting Bruto in that category. But the fact that Bob, back on January 31st, decided to work him in a team workout here with Country Grammar and certainly wasn't disgraced, I think speaks volumes of how highly the Baffert barn must think of Bruto. Long story short, as we watch basically the end of this workout, uh, Steve, who do you like in race four and why? I'm going to go a little bit of an upsetter in this race. Um, and, and I'm going to go backwards in here and, and, and talk a little bit about Scary Fast Smile, who four or five races in a row, this horse was really expected to run good. And he really did put it together last time. And if you look at this horse sheet wise, he had been running nines and tens on a regular basis and he moved way forward to a two. He's back today now, and, I, and I'm wondering if he doesn't go back to that You're nine. You're expecting a bounce. Morning. I'm expecting a bounce a little bit on this horse. Certainly was a great effort last time. If he comes back and runs that same way, he's going to be very, very tough. Bruto has been away for such a long time, and, and his numbers, he never got past a nine in here. So you've got some horses in here that are actually – Normally not all that fast. The fastest horse by far is Escape Route, and I think he's the horse to beat. But I'm going to go with an upsetter in here. I'm going to go with C to Success, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, you got a horse in here that gets a seven-pound bug in here. You, you go to the really lightweight. Second of all, look at the look at the fractions in this race of who's going to set them. The other speed appears to me to be Bruto, who's taking the blinkers off. Emily Ellingwood really has one way that she really likes to ride, and that is to go to the front. And I think that that's, she's going to do that here. Go back now four races. This horse had a really nice race here at Santa Anita and a number that's extremely competitive with these. And then three races. Look at that time, 107 and 2. Tom, we had a huge Santa, a Santa Ana that day at Del Mar. Yes, we Very did. Very hot. And look at the fractions. Look at the difference. 42 and 3. They ran 107 and 2. So, obviously, if there's a, a win going behind C to success, we're going to double our bet in here. But, but seriously, I thought both of those races were very good efforts. Thoroughgraph makes a concerted effort to adjust their numbers with the wind. This horse ran two sixes in a row. Both of those numbers are extremely competitive in here, providing that escape route and uh, scary fast smile don't run their absolute best. And I think Ellingwood has a good chance to get away from this field. It's only six furlongs. And, Tom, over half the races at this distance, 43 of them, have been won by wire to wire. So 23 out of 43 have been won wire to wire. So I'm looking for an upsetter in a short field in here. I'm going to put C to success over the very consistent escape route. Two over five for me here in the fourth. Small field, big price. So says Steve Pollock. Number two, C to success. The longest price on the morning line, 10 to one is Steve's top selection. Let's take a look at race number five. Begins the 50 cent late pick five. We're back on the turf course. This race is six and a half furlongs on the flat turf surface for allowance optional claiming types. Non-winners of two other than a field of seven. The morning line favorite number two, Harbored Memories, who we haven't seen since August of last year. Before we get your pick in the race, uh, Steve, I wanted to watch the replay that Greg Dar exits. This race also included Fantastic, who ran in this race. And the winner, Mucho Del Oro back on February 5th actually came back yesterday to win a $100,000 stakes race at Turf Paradise. Greg Dar is a lightly raced five-year-old, only nine lifetime starts. Before we watch the replay, I wanted to point out a couple of things to you. He breaks from the outside post. He's the gray horse, so he's going to be easy to follow. But watch how quick he breaks out of the gate, and yet he drops back. And then listening to uh, Frank Miramati's closing call, he says that uh, Greg Dar was strongly closing. Let's take a listen, and let's watch the workout, excuse me, the replay for both Greg Dar and Fantastic's last effort. Goes in. They're in the gate. And they're off. Greg Dar began well. Mucho Del Oro is much quicker, though, and he opens up in a hurry. Whooping J, Eastern Ocean. Those two now go by, and Mucho Del Oro will settle in third. That group is followed by Tiz Plus, racing about four or five lengths off the lead. Outside of him comes Coultard, who has about six lengths or seven to make up. At the rail, it's Exaltation. 
Fantastic is next. Greg Dar, who broke well, is toward the back of the field, followed by Crew Dragon and stretch running Crew of Amazonia Trails. Whooping Jay tries to shake loose coming to the quarter pole. It's a two length lead on Eastern Ocean in second. Mucho Del Oro now claims the second spot with a perfect trip. They're followed by Coulthard trying to mount a bid. As the field turns for home, Whooping Jay has a two length lead on the extreme outside. Fantastic is starting a motorhome. Coulthard is just in front of him. Down at the rail, Tiz Plus is running on too. A 16th to go. Mucho Del Oro clinging to a two-length lead. And it's Mucho Del Oro. Nicely handled by Juan Hernandez. Tiz Plus second. Fantastic was third. Then it's a photo between Coulthard and a strongly closing Greg Dar. You just heard Frank Maramati say, uh, Steve, that Greg Dar was strongly closing and we're watching the gallop out and the gray was in front. Since that race, we see trainer Phil D'Amato put in some brisk works, including a 47 flat and a minute and change on the training track, or I should say the main track. Do you like Greg Dar or are you going elsewhere in race five? That's who I like today, uh, Tom. I, I think that the, the key for Greg Dar is actually going to be the flat today. They're running. This is six and a half furlongs on the flat. We start in a little bit of a shoot, so they do make a little bit of a left-hand turn. Uh, but I think the key is, is when they were crossing the dirt, it was really hesitant on Greg Dar. I hope you folks pick that up on the, on the video for him to switch leads. And when he switched leads, he really exploded and he was able to go by a bunched up field. And I think that's what he can do today. There's not a whole lot of pace in here. So this certainly isn't a pace play, but I think this is a horse that on a flat surface, when they straighten out today without having to cross over that dirt, I think he's going to be able to do what it looked like he could do there. Second time Diamato is is good with almost anything. I mean, he's really, really a guy that when he runs twice in a meet or they do something twice, they improve. They'll, they'll figure out what it was that they didn't do perfectly last time and they'll do it right this time. And I, and we're going to talk about that rider a little bit. This Ryan Curatolo. I'm very impressed with what I see from him. Not a, maybe a bit, maybe a big enough sample to go all in, but I really like what I see so far. And he's going to be a big part of what we're going to do today because we've got him on a long shot later on in the card as well. But Greg Dar going to be my top horse in here. Not a whole lot separating him from Fantastic. I think he's got a little bit more of a kick. I thought the speed horses in here were a little bit shaky. Maybe got her number, maybe Jungle Cry on the outside. I, I don't think the pace is going to be that fast, but I think these two horses will be able to overcome that slower pace in here. And, and I'm hoping that Harvard Memories needs a race in here because that one's races certainly are competitive. But for me, it's the three Greg Dar over the one fantastic. Handicapping is all about opinions. Our friends at Trip No Pros like the chances of number seven, Jungle Cry, for some of the reasons Steve outlined. Doesn't appear to be a whole lot of early pace. Another Golden Gate shipper coming down to Southern California. But if you're not familiar with TripNotePros.com, make sure you check it out. They watch the replay so you don't have to do the work. Race number six begins the 50 cent late pick five, excuse me, the 50 cent late pick four, I should say. Starter optional claiming types, three-year-olds and up. The only three-year-old is on the bottom, number six, Egomania. But the morning line favorite, number four, Mongolian four. Board. nine to five on the morning line steve this to me small field but again a difficult race to handicap not easy uh, i'm going to go against a couple horses that i did not like the way they were running down the stretch and they were both in the same race and that is the one bud knight and the five star sailor they really look like they were struggling last time out uh the horse that i think is going to win this race is the three horse street ruckus uh street ruckus had some uh, very very nice effort five back at del mar i'm going to toss the one turn race uh, at Churchill Downs, uh, that if they don't handle that, that a lot of horses won't handle that. And, I, and this horse has come back with a couple of nice grass races in a row. I think you can go back to that race, five races back. Vladimir Sarin again, uh, Tom, he's just been red hot. His horses are all doing the right things. And uh, hoping Rispoli gets a couple of wins here going in and maybe changes his mind and decides to stay here in California because I really like the way this guy rides. I'm going to put Mongolian Ford second. Looks like the best of the speed horses in here to me. Certainly got to like the way Maldonado's been riding. He's had a heck of a meet, and I'm sure his business will pick up a little bit with these other guys going away. I'll put this one second. Street Ruckus on top, Mongolian Ford second. Back on the turf course in race number seven, one mile of the distance, three-year-old filly, starter optional claiming types, program scratch of the seven, leaves us with a field of eight. Number five, Travel Smart, returning from the layoff, who's also a grade one winner, adds Lasix and also takes the blinkers off. Five to two on John White's morning line. This is your forte. Give us a winner. You know, I, I got to start out with Travel Smart. 
uh, this horse has run three 14s on the thoroughgraph sheets. I've watched his tape. He hasn't improved. He's actually scratched on the vets list twice. This is information that you get from thoroughgraph. I think it's extremely valuable. So for me, this is a horse that I think is very vulnerable. I think the first time Lasix might be able to help him. But to take five to two on a horse like that, and I started looking at horses that like Beechgrass, Suetta's Ghost, even Ice Cold Gold really struggled when he did get home last time and gets a big rider upgrade. I'm going to go with a first-time turfer in here that I don't love the pedigree on, and usually when I play first-time turf horses, I've got to love the pedigree. I like everything else I see about Girl Ranger. I like the work pattern, that it's steady. I like the fact that Rispoli gets on the horse, and I think this horse is going to be able to save some ground and make a run, and I have a feeling the price is going to drift up. I did hear from some of the clockers that the workouts weren't great on this horse, and I'm going to go in reverse and say when I see a turf horse or I see a horse trying the turf for the first time that's not working well in the dirt, I know the price is going to go up because the clockers are really influencing the odds, and I like that, actually. I don't want to knock those guys. I think it's impossible to tell from a dirt work how a horse is going to run on the turf Therefore, I'm going to move Girl Ranger up. I know the price will be worth it, and we're getting a great turf rider. She's so shiny, actually ran the best race, in my opinion, two races back. It's going to be a little bit too short for me to put on top, but I'm going to use this one as well. So for me, the race is the four Girl Ranger over the one She's So Shiny. Echoing what Steve said, I looked up the pedigree for Girl Ranger. Soul Flyer, the dam, never tried the turf. This is her first foal as well, so there's not much to go on. But as Steve mentioned, sometimes the uh, negative workout information on the main track can be a blessing if you like a runner on the turf course. That could be the case, case with Girl Ranger, who is 6-1 to one on the morning line. Race number eight begins the $1 Golden Hour Pick 4, linking our last two races here at Sanita with the last two races at Golden Gate. Did you play it yesterday? Did you hit it? If you did, your $2,000 richer had paid in excess of $2,000. Congratulations to those winning ticket holders. And we kick things off today, sprinting six furlongs in the main track. Phillies and mares, $12,500 is the claiming tag. Number five, Busy Painter, first off the claim for trainer Kristen Mulhall, is the three-to-one morning line favorite. Another tough race and a tough sequence. Tom, the golden hour pick four is a golden Tremendous, pick. tremendous. I mean, it's unbelievable. Higher oh. minimum, lower takeout, better payouts. Golden Gate always kind of throws a monkey wrench or two into the equation. If you're not playing it, I mean, come on, you, you're, you're, you're being foolish. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm, I'm, I'm an above average better. You are probably too, Tom. But, but to be honest with you, to really play the pick five and really get coverage, even at 50 cents, this is a bet that's really made for a guy that wants to bet 100, 150 bucks and isn't a big deal for that, that person and say, man, I want to get some real good coverage. It's a fantastic bet. The payouts are off the charts. The higher minimum means you can't spread, you know, and be stupid about it. You got to be really like a sharpshooter and really narrow it down. Find your single. Singles are really valuable, but if there's a race that looks tough, go ahead and hit that all ball and you can still get some decent coverage. Uh, you know, for a, for a fair amount, right in that $100 range, I, I think it's a fantastic bet. I've had some fortune playing it this year. I, I've lost maybe the last couple of weeks. I haven't hit one, but uh, I'm still a little bit ahead playing it. I think it's a great bet. Tell us who you like in this first leg and why, Steve. I like Busy Painter, the five. I love the trainer angle on this on this horse. If you look at this horse's work pattern down below, and I actually pulled the last form out from January, this horse had one workout for the trainer that had it before, I don't want to bash anybody, but Kristen Mulhall claims this horse. And now all of a sudden you see very consistent workouts. Can a trainer move a horse up, Tom? Absolutely they can. And what I like about this one is, is this one really ran well despite a poor break last time for about the first five and a half furlongs. So I think the difference between six and six and a half here at Santa Anita is a big deal. Those six and a half races have been very fair. The six furlong races have been speed oriented. I think Busy Painter gets out there, gets on the lead. That's a good speed rider. And Kristen Mulhall does a heck of a good job. I think she's going to upgrade this horse. And I think Busy Painter goes all the way on the front end. The horse to worry about late is the seven take a leap who cuts back, is in very good form, has the same number on sheets sprinting as this horse does routing. So I think this horse will handle the the uh, distance switch, the seven take a leap, my second horse. But for me, it's the five. Busy painter. We close it out on race number nine with the feature race in the card. It's the grade three San Luis race stakes. Mile and a half on the turf course. We start about halfway up the hillside turf course. And there's two important scratches in race number nine. Scratch the morning line favorite number one. Say the word will not compete. Also number seven award winner has been declared out of the, the race. We, that leaves us with a field of seven. I'm sure the revised morning line favorite is going to be another runner from the Phil D'Amato bar in the speedy number six. Acclimate. Also race number nine begins the $5 golden hour daily double linking our last race with the last 
last race at uh, Golden Gate. Before we get your selection, Steve, a reminder to you and everybody, spring forward tonight. That's right. we got to turn wow. the clocks ahead one hour. We don't want you to miss first post tomorrow, 1230 p.m. Pacific time. We've got a good eight race card lined up for Sunday. But first things first, give us a winner to close it out, Steve. I'm losing an hour's sleep? You are. You are. I'm, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news. Man, I'm grouchy already. Okay. <laughs> So we scratched the horse that was really probably the, the most likely winner of the day, say the word, correct? Yes, and, sir. And award winner was going to be the one to press Acclimate. So now Acclimate's going to be, what, eight to five, maybe even less. Going to be tough to catch. He's an old boy. I'm going to put him second because he's eight years old. And, you know, I don't see much for him in here. Current is a horse that's really pulling and at shorter distances. I don't like that. The, the outside two horses don't have the best post positions in the world, and they got nothing on sheets over the rest of these. So I'm going to go long in here, and I'm going to take a first-time four-year-old coming off a layoff, 20 to 1 in the morning line, the three-horse Airman. Now, Airman is a late runner. He's a grinder. I think this rider is going to put him in the right spot on the rail. We're going to need a little bit of help. We're going to need some of these horses to come back. But I've been really impressed with what this Ryan Corotolo has been able to do. And he's really been able to win on some big price horses. I was going to say to for the folks to include this one in your exotics with my top horse scratching. I'm going to just move him up to the top in here. I've been making small win bets on this guy at big prices. And I think this horse has a shot. Acclimate certainly the horse to beat. But at 15, 20 to 1, I give this horse a shot in the nightcap. Bombs away to close it out on the Saturday card. So says Steve Pollock. Steve, it's always a delight to have you as my seminar guest. For those people who enjoy your commentary and your analysis, how do they find it on a daily basis? We know you're on the Racing Jason show. Or you, do you have a website? Do you have a phone number? Do you give out your email address? <laughs> what do you Racing, do? Racing Jason is always the easiest way to go for me. RacingJason.com. And in fact... If you don't want to get up at seven o'clock in the morning, and I certainly AIEB, don't want to. AIEB, yeah. If you don't want to listen to us on the live radio, you can you can go at the, the uh, Jason puts the show up on the air at about eight oh five. So okay. eight oh five Saturday, you can listen to the to the replay of the show. I'm on from about seven fifteen to about seven thirty every Saturday. So I clock in for fifteen minutes a week of official work, Tom. You got a better job than I do, that's for sure. Steve, <laughs> thanks so much for joining me. It's always a delight to have you. Good luck not only today, but for the remainder of the year. Thanks for having me, Tom. I love coming up to uh, spend the day with you. It's great to have you here at the Great Race Place. It's great to have you watching the seminar as well. Want to wish you nothing but luck on today's card. Keep in mind, next voice you hear will be tracking on to Frank Miramati, updating us with any late program changes. Thanks so much for watching, everybody, and have fun. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Santa Anita Park. The track is fast, and the turf course is firm. Rail on the turf out zero feet. Here are the changes. The first race starts the early pick five. Scratch number six, Candy Zip, and scratch number nine, Vroisky. Six and nine out of the first. No show wagering in race two with the scratch at number four, Ducks on the Pond. In the third, number one, Vulin, two pounds over. Race four starts the Rainbow Six. There's 284,000 in the jackpot carryover. In the fifth, start of the late pick five, we have no changes. And there are no changes in race six. Seventh race, program scratch of seven, Precious Insight. Eighth race, number four, Island Life, two over. Six, Big Passion, one pound over. The ninth is the San Luis Rey, grade three, 